I thought it'd be a nice night to be informal, so you know, just, we can just relax and enjoy ourselves. Uh, I'm Ken Miller, the director of Bayless Library. I think we've met everybody tonight. Um, I'd really like to thank, uh, thank you for coming to our North Country Authors event. Um, this event combines our Superior Poetry Cafe with uh, visiting authors, and so that's kind of fun. Um, and Mark Dunn is going to be on at 7, and uh, uh, Danielle uh, Sosen will be on at 8. Okay, and uh, again, thank you both the authors. Thanks, uh, Tom, for uh, uh, co-sponsoring with the River History Museum. We appreciate that very much. And uh, um, the Library's Program Committee, of course, Susan. Tonight, Mark D. Dunn is here from Sioux, Ontario. He has an MA in English Literature and Language from Wilfrid Lanier University in Waterloo, Ontario, which is right near where my mother was born in, in Cambridge. And um, in addition to poetry, he writes song and teaches at Sioux College. His new poetry book, Fancy Clapping, is available tonight for purchase and signing. After Mark's reading, there'll be a short break uh, for refreshments and book signing, and then Danielle will be up. So, at the, end, at the end, should we feature with him some fancy clapping? Yes. <laughs> yes, you'll have to work that out with him. Mark, it's all yours. Thank you. Give me some right now. Thank you so much. It's uh, very happy to be here. Uh, thanks, Ken and, and Susan, for uh, organizing this and everyone for being here. Um, in honor of um, summer, because uh, summer, of course, is a very special time here. Um, I guess every time is special here, but. Uh, so we're so brief and beautiful that uh, we have to enjoy it. It's the time when the lakes really come alive, um, at least for me, because I don't, I don't go near the lakes in the winter. Um, so I wanted to read a couple of uh, poems from my first book, uh, Ghost Music. There's a chapter in this book called uh, Ghost Water, which deals with uh, the Great Lakes, and in honor of our uh, uh, other author, uh, Danielle, uh, whose book is about, or is set in, Lake Superior. Um, so I'll read uh, the, um, two from this book. Um, first, Big Water. To imagine its size, corral a proton in a thimble. You are that shy particle at the boundless center. To imagine its depth, draw memory for the first eyes you saw opening your own to the light. To imagine its taste, magnify all that has rained on summer gardens and the storms that strip lilacs of their scent. This next poem is um, also a, a place poem from this area called Bawating. Uh, of course, we all likely know that's the name of the place. Uh, I, I've told this story many times and I think I've told it, I told it here before, but um, I have many correspondences. Uh, some, some of my friends, we communicate only through, mostly through letter, even though we live very close to each other. And um, one of my friends, uh, Roland, the poet, very active, very uh, political in native rights issues. Um, I would address letters to him, uh, but instead of saying Suzanne Maria, I'd say Bawating. And they always arrived. And I was so excited. I said, the Canadian postal system uh, Canada Post recognizes Bawating as the name of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. This is a legal precedent, can't we use this? And then I realized it was the postal code that they're actually responding to. <laughs> you could put Jupiter in it probably. Yeah. So, this is a, a poem called Bawating, and it's, I love uh, sitting by the river and just <coughs> seeing sort of the layers of, of time that have, are still there, uh, kind of rippling. But what? One. Day begins with the river. Impetuous shock and morning steams into cloud. A resurrection of gulls calling in the fish stout air. Machines yawning, the American shore at work. A freighter winks a rusty stern and needles the southern locks. A small country on board leans over to see where it began, this naming of land. Day begins with the old man walking his dog along cinder block ruins, through heel squelched butts along the river, in the sand along the river, 
where tires kicked away from condoms and beer cans, exclamations pointing to suburban houses. Two, count the beasts in the river. A primordial swan fans vapor wings, rises, while the sloth-backed snake, older than its legend, enters the day, curls up from the river to take the old man's gift. And every morning, the finless beast and the old man walking his dog make stories in the hatching day. Something passes between them, or so it seems, until light fables it, and the whole rattling day forgets. Uh, this spring I put out a new book um, called Fancy Clapping. I don't know if I'll read the Fancy Clapping poem. It's uh, uh, perhaps, we'll see. <laughs> uh, it's strange and kind of uh, rhythmic. But I'll start with a poem. It's sort of an Orpheus cycle of poems. And Orpheus um, is that Greek uh, character who uh, played the harp so well, he'd make the gods weep. And then um, his wife is taken from him he stops playing his music, all the seasons stop, um, everything stops, so the gods allow him to go back uh, into the underworld and retrieve his wife. And, um, so this is a, uh, there's a cycle of Orpheus poems that go through that, there are three throughout the book, and um, this is the first one. It's called Maps to the Underworld. One. There's no mercy for the poet who enters uninvited. The gates crashed and no party within Stumbling, bound in a darkness that is fearless of the sun, batting cobwebs, he moves along rock walls, guided by the daylight fading behind him. Yet drawn in, welcome to the cave, he leaves with a prize, some power over flesh. Or oblivious, waking from a nap under a tree, not knowing that the ground is no longer ground, that the trees are no longer in dialogue with his lungs. Sun, no longer the sun, but the memory of these things. He stays for a year and a day, returns without losing a moment. Forcing the veil aside, he shrugs away grace, a willed transilience that offends all who've earned their deaths. And speaking of death, this is a, a poem called uh, uh, Part of this is set in Michigan, and uh, the kernel of it, um, it comes from my partner and I, who is in this poem identified only as M. Her name is Maria, but um, for legal reasons, I just put M. And um, we were driving through Michigan. I was driving through Michigan. I was doing the driving, I should say. And she was the hapless passenger. And I was thinking of this poem. I had some lines of this poem in my mind and I was kind of working with the rhythm of it, and uh, I was so into that that I ran through a red light. Oh, now, were you yeah. writing it while you were writing through a red light? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not physically. I was just sort of in the space. <laughs> I wasn't driving. So, uh, yeah, I went through the red light. Luckily, no, no one was coming. I'm giving you a little too much away. But so I call this, um, I can drive if you like. <laughs> and then that's and part two deals with another uh, car incident in my life. One, it is strange at night how the road ends and a day of travel still ahead. Part of this poem had me run a red light on a Michigan highway. No one was coming, but I didn't know that. There was no other way for me at that moment but to run the red light while pacing this poem, turn into the gas station and leave the engine on. I'm writing it down at the counter, paying for the gas. The guy stares like he hears ghost music from across a lake. M in the bathroom thanking the gods. The red light low like a firefly in the windshield. And so far she hasn't said a word about it. No hint of iron between us. She'd said, red light, red light, red light. <laughs> With me breaking softly but late and no cars coming so I turned. M in the seat, breathing. Sorry, I said. Perhaps our hands touched. Two. It is strange at night. Twenty years on, and still strange, I remember the song that played when the Mazda with bad brakes took out my grandfather's minivan. The glass froth 
pellets from the side window, stinging. It may have been hail or tacks from the carpeted sky popping away. In the, in the blind spin, the whole earth becomes a blur of snow, a 180 twist on ice. The Mazda would have made it across the country without stopping had I not taken my green light. No one shouts, green light. <laughs> Just a nod, a nudge, a glance to the sky. The forgotten beetle on the radio. Nothing came easy for him or for me at that moment. I stepped out into the intersection and left the van running in gear, coughing forward a wounded train. The man in the Mazda making his escape leaked brown fluid from a flattened nose, parts of my body in his grill. Where are the spirits now that I'm driving? Ghosts in the fog along the highway are stuck to their places. In this car, I am quicker than the dead. <laughs> this is a poem called um, um, Let Us Now Invent the Past. And um, it's sort of, uh, I guess, about small town life. <laughs> there was that time in someone's childhood when bad things didn't happen. Young people became old people. A graduate found a job and defined a life. Parents honored children, although it wasn't called for. And a teacher's hand on the back of his student was a comfort, not a reason to call the lawyers. It's innocence derived from nostalgia as much as ignorance of Greek tragedy. That perfect age we came from is peopled with harmless eccentrics. The first man in town to own hip waders. The three-legged dog drinking milk from doorstep bottles. The nun who went mad trying to kiss her own lips. And the big man stacking lumber for the space program. While the woman so beautiful she became your mother watched, laughing, her teeth compared to pearls by a poet who wrote a column in the local paper. It's not a bad place, this past no one had this place that returns to us in the burn of time on flesh. I'll just switch back to, um, to ghost music for a moment and read you a poem called Neighbors. Do you have any uh, comments or questions? Or can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Yeah, is everything all right? Okay. This is Neighbors. Half of all that is in the world is love, and the rest is becoming. You are part of the subliminal wind, unthought of music in your voice. I have seen you walking through parks, your head down or up, your eyes glassed and twitching with the river, a veil over every heart you encounter. And I have said hello, and have walked by without saying hello. Let's not war over it. We are in light. On the moon, a million suns in the soil. On the sea, a ship turns salt water fresh. And where on earth do people thirst? <coughs> oh, very heart. I am becoming silence again, and draw deep into silence again. The moon over every heart, silence again. This is another um, lake poem called Thaw. I love that time on Lake Superior when the ice is breaking up and it starts singing. There you go, and it's just like a wind chime, lake chime, I guess. Uh, spring, nearly at least, and the lake edge is raw from scab ice, and the sand is veined with kelp, veined with lost lines and lures, walking memory around the bay. Between rock and water is the infinite wash. Sound returns with the split lake, the crystal tear, a wave reaching until the ice is gone. A freighter, locked in since November, moves again, flexes its bow to shake off sleep. 
I lost my hold here last fall. My name in the waves, in the bird's mouth, the peeper's tongue translated by the Zawapoli to sound nothing like my name. The wind is chatter through pine and has no sound but for the things it moves. All voice is sympathy after all. And on this lake I hear the mines in Marquette, the drowned ships with their last great howl. I hear paddles from birch canoes and the evol evolution of rock into dust. Hello, come on in. I'll read, um, I'll read Fancy Clapping. This is the title poem from the new collection. And um, it's sort of a play on rhythm. Um, it's a little long, but we'll get, we'll get through. <coughs> Fancy Clapping. What is the story of our heads? Who is the movement of bodies? An evening of sitting brings us to the moment when the juggler incites the room into clapping. The steady marching beat of one, two, three, four, while he runs a tight circle under levitating torches that never seem to drop close enough to his hand to be thrown up into the air again. Is he even necessary? The miracle seems self-contained, by itself a thing to behold. The juggler is just in the way and has no claim on perception. Next to me, a woman who smells gently of vomit cannot catch the rhythm of one, two, three, four, and throws the whole row off by two, beats that we never recover. There is a hesitation in her, as if an invisible spring hovers between her hands, as if her palms were charged with opposing currents and repel each other. For just the blip of a second, long enough to make an echo that adds up to an extra beat and throws the juggler off his game. Arrhythmia spreads along our row and jumps the aisle. It moves like a wave through the crowd until everyone begins to doubt the rhythm they've carried. The juggler's assistant comes on stage, clapping hands like a country song, and the whole room follows again. That's when someone I cannot see decides to emphasize a beat. He or she makes a tent of two like the point of an EKG that goes flat after a brief spike. The accent is a crease that folds the marching applause on itself and reminds me of the trouble that accents give in translation. Oh yeah? Or oh yeah? Be careful. Finally smooth to the flat four, the rhythm builds up a volume so the can music can't be heard and hooting from the balcony is drowned completely in a square din that sounds like boots trudging home. That is when a gang of drummers, arriving after a late gig, introduce angles to the square, fit five into four, nine into eight. They play against the room, lay counterpoint across the steady flash, fancy clapping the juggler into orbit. He drops the baton to the stage and runs to the back of the theater, the fire hose he thought He'd seen before the show is nowhere. He runs farther through the exit with the audience inside, fancy clapping itself to ash. I'll read, um, let's see, just want to check the time. All right. <laughs> <coughs> Make sure that's in rhythm, though. <laughs> or in rhyme. Hi, Carl. Hey. This is the anonymous poet. There are no people in his poems, yet something clings in the churning phrase. Maybe a leaf's edge resembles a bat wing summoning a chill, the stand-in for a nightmare, or the wind throwing voices brags of its memory. But you will find no people in his poems. Prepare yourself for loneliness. And no acclaim for rock stars or presidents. The history he pulls from is the memory of seed, the vestigial path toward another go-around. 
Go, he says. Find someone in your poems. Aren't they all? I'll do um, the second Orpheus poem, uh, Maps to the Underworld 2. Let's go. Ariadne uh, is Orpheus's wife who he goes to rescue. When Orpheus goes down, the yellow dot that he is blips from the screen, a candle becoming a stick again. Flame into the air diffused, a note settling into memory once the tune has played. He leaves his car keys on the table, his wallet on the nightstand in the hotel room near the gate. His mind is on the bone gift for the three-mouthed dog. Let it fight itself, tear itself, blind at the post, and Orpheus, just the shadow scent of his hand on one tongue, fangs from both sides snapping in, will slip by. Mad from its own blood, Cerebus has gone literal into a new Ouroboros, devouring, devoured. And maybe Dante in another reel is watching reading the arch for his dismissal. But here, everything is older, more dream than story. Here is Orpheus going down without a signal. Even the sun forgets him. His author forgets Ariadne's trick. No string to guide him, unreflecting to light. And when Orpheus goes down, the rest of us don't stop. We just keep going, our lives going, with the pulse of all that is around us going. And when Orpheus is down, the bright movements of the sky are still as bright, and the stars are marveled at just as frequently. Um, of course, I was wrong. Ariadne is not Orpheus' wife. Ariadne is the one who ties the string to um, Theseus when he goes in to kill uh, the Minotaur. I scrambled the, uh, the uh, <coughs> well, I blended the, the myths, and then it um, scrambled in my mind momentarily. <laughs> Persephone is uh, Orpheus' as well. You would like my grandmother used to say that dumb ones don't know any different and the smart ones will think that's the way you meant it to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, most days I don't, I'm not quite sure where I fall in this two streets. Um, this is a, a poem called First Poem. And it, it kind of comes from an experience where uh, someone was very resistant to reading uh, or even sharing a thought and then uh, read a poem. And then that's about the only actual thing that happened from, the, from this poem. So first poem, it was a poem of accusation, of unrequited invitations, of jealousy of song. Some pearl-voiced singer sang to everyone around, but not specifically to her, and she wanted a song to contain her, although she knew no song could. She read, having never spoken, scratching her ankle through the cuff of her jeans, scratching a vaudeville rhythm. There were words in the scratching my mind couldn't hold both, and the ant or vague insect that crawled out from her leg, it stitched across the painted floor, coming like a cat to a person afraid of cats. I moved my foot away, and it made up the new distance, all six or eight of its legs, swallowed the space, and I knew I'd end up crushing it, which I did, but with some reservation, just the tap of, a, of the sole against the cement floor, painted a soupy red anyway, like watery blood. The ant writhed and shivered, and I watched it die, not certain what it was that I'd killed. <coughs> I'll just switch back here for a moment. This is my uh, response to uh, the perennial question. Um, what's the value of poetry? What does it matter? <laughs> And um, this is called <coughs> Apology 2, number two, that is. I have a series of apologies. <laughs> <coughs> she wants me to believe only rich, 
sorry, she wants me to believe only the rich make poems and scream with her at the ivory men who never gave the chance to have the things she hates. I haul out the sleepy examples, the dusty giants from fishing towns and loyalist towns, prairie towns and gutter alleys, the ones with earthy half moons under their nails, the knots on their spines fused and aching. She answers that each gave up privilege to hit the road and rails or to live on scraps and shacks near the crazy edge because brief inheritance was too much to satisfy. Without a conviction seated in wealth, only a fool would play with words and expect to be paid. Put down your pen, she said, you are pretending. I tried to believe and would have, but a sound that will not be named kept calling in a language unknown to me. This is, um, does anyone remember Gil Scott Heron? Mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, a poet and a musician from, very active in the 70s, but until recently, and he died, I think, last year, uh, maybe the year prior. He had a very um, troubled life, um, but his, um, he's very <coughs> well known for one song, which is kind of a rap, came out in 1974, called uh, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. And this is my sort of um, tribute to Gil Scott Heron. I call it the next revolution. The revolution will be compromised or passed by, mistaken for rags and used to mop dust so the boss can sit down. The revolution will be compromised over lattes in the back room with the TV muted in the corner and maps on the table marked with blue and white lines through flat ranges that make jigsaw nations from boundless earth. The revolution will be compromised in silk stockings, leather, heels on the groin, the safe word slurred, muddled by translation, electric clips and the fierce sodomy of market shares. The revolution will be compromised. The revolution will be compromised. The revolution is dressed like Goldilocks, paste on freckles, peel in the heat, walls drip in desperate basements. The revolution has confessed to poisoning the well. It cries and razor sobs, will say what's required, sign the contract, endorse any product. The revolution has a bit in its mouth, takes it without complaint. The revolution has canceled its subscriptions, turned the thermostat past 30, and left town. I don't necessarily believe that. I see a lot of very interesting things happening. This is uh, also in this book, uh, Ghost Music, there's a, one chapter called um, The um, Miraculous Advancements in Barnyard Physics that deal with uh, life on the farm. And um, I'll just read you one of those. Um, probably read you two of those. But first, uh, this is the drug farmer questions his guidance counselor's advice. He might have given too much had the crow at dawn not reminded that saving a little for the next day is how it's always been done. He held back, held back when seeds withered to let the real stuff out. The sun clamped the sprout heads, drawing matter into a bright vacuum. He held back when letters came from the bank, wanting to slug the mailman for saying, can't be good news every day, you know, as if he made the news. The envelope mined valleys between his calluses. He left blood webs on the mortgager's pen. This day was given for one more roll at good luck. Horsehair charms like Christmas ornaments strung along fencing, swept curses from the air, he hoped. And he held back when the rains did not. Too much necessity pooling in serious knots along the furrows. And again, when rain forgot what it was about and settled in mist over jungle hills to the south, letting earth become powder, he held back. Beanstalks stayed mum about secret destinations. Cloud bellies, just far enough from earth to be alien, were the untouched goal, a target for ambition.
usually I bring a guitar with me and we uh, sort of uh, shake it up a little bit. <laughs> but um, I, um, I didn't bring it. <laughs> you provide, <coughs> provide the recording with any of your poems? <laughs> uh, none of these. Mostly the, uh, the poems and the songs are separate. Um, so the poems are, for me at least, uh, uh, read. And then the, I don't know why, it's just the way it always is. And then the lyrics to the songs are sung. And I always feel that the lyrics don't really stand up without the guitar. I don't know. It's weird. I don't know how it works, but that's kind of how it's... Have you ever taken a poem and later put music to it? Mm -hmm. Other people's poems. I've done that with, uh, with William Blake quite a bit. Um, and, uh, various poems like that. Um, not usually my own though. Usually the, for us, the songs, the, um, the lyrics come with the music at the same time. I'll do um, maybe just a couple more. I'll do one long one and then one short one. This is from uh, Fancy Clapping and it's um, Settle in, because it's, it's <laughs> we're going to be here a while. It's a little long. It's called Found Missing. And um, it's sort of uh, a meditation on um, laws and let's, we could say gender. I'm not going to tell you what I think it's about, because it really doesn't matter. But um, anyways, Found Missing. In Hammurabi's rule book, which he took down from the sun in some versions, from a lesser star in others, there was nothing written about love and turning cheeks. It was all eye for eye, a life for an accusation. From it, witch hunters inherited the water test. The river as judge decided with its currents whether the accused did it or not. If not, the accuser was given his death. If so, the accuser inherited the drowned man's goods. Not a bad deal, all said. Either way, there was one fewer mouth to feed, but it certainly made one want to practice at swimming, to become lighter than water. There were only strong swimmers in Babylon and the drowned. The difference between Hammurabi and, say, Joseph Smith is mostly that we can see tablets in their original form whereas the gold leaf Smith read from disappeared with Moroni or whomever the thin stranger who visited was, leaving only Smith's translation. The same thing, really, because no one, as far as I can tell, saw the sun god hand off to Hammurabi, no one but Hammurabi himself, and you can never trust a king to tell the truth about what's going on. Everything is mythic to a king. Millennia chopped away like hands falling and rising in dust covering the cities have erased the knowledge of flight, of distant talk. It will take all that time again to regain the faintest efficiencies and look how far we've come. A short time of centuries and we have gained back incandescence and the poisoning of wells through sewer veins, but in a larger well, a more invasive incandescence. The entire ocean a well, Gehenna, spilled over every inch that humans touch, I have seen it. A short time of centuries, and we gaze, and we gaze ourselves blind, watching ourselves reflected, ourselves entranced, by the vision we had of ourselves, in chains, yet unbound, chained to the toxic history we have, invented and follow as if on rails, mercy. Half a mina for a tree poached from your neighbor's land. The same price for a blow that takes a woman's life. Or, if the woman loses a child from his strike, his daughter is put to death. Hammurabi doesn't say what the man without a daughter loses. A whole mina? One mina is 60 shekels, or 13 bucks, my computer tells me. Hammurabi's gold standard, a life for six and one half dollars which can't buy your way out of a taxi cab these days, won't put you in a movie seat. But I complain of things that no longer matter. We are deserted. By our history is deserted. Beginnings with no ending. Beginning to begin, to begin at the middle of things, much as a dream begins by being. We are, and to remind us, we tear the chain roots from the ground, our past dissolving in the steady light, time square, indefinite. 
If I promised Hammurabi I would not steal the prized vase from the Museum of Inequities, and really meant at that moment, I will not steal, but find in a different moment a need to steal the vase, I don't know, maybe your life depends on it, and steal the vase, did I lie? And is it worth lying to Hammurabi to have the vase for a spittoon at the bar to marvel at in private and fawn at the lithe gods and honeycomb beards who dance in tableau, a Sumerian rite that Hammurabi himself has forgotten? Braggarts might swoon at the prize, but I count the parts I will lose when it's found missing. For this theft, chained to a rock overlooking the vacuous sea, a nice view for those few moments on waking, the blind pain of the night before cooled by the morning, watching the dark squiggle from the horizon grow into an eagle, and before the first tuck of its beak into the belly, a simple kind of bliss. But that is not Hammurabi's solution. For him, it's the hand that must be excised, as if the hand had offended on its own. In a small cell, the severed hands of thieves plot escape, wait until the guard is fallen into his hash slumber, pick the lock with curved nails, then scale the harsh brick to the ground. On their own, the hands are blind, groping through grass for familiar texture. Maybe a set of eyes plucked out, or a pair of feet removed for kicking a free man can be found and befriended. Maybe a wanderer with a stumped wrist will stop, recognizing the knot of veins or the curve of a fingernail. Were there prosthetic limbs in Babylon, finely geared mechanisms like clocks banded with pulleys and alive with sprockets, digits carved from pomegranate and lashed to the wrist with leather straps and suction cups, designed by the son or brother of the hatchet man? They share office space in the same squat hut. Was this Babylon? Looking back on the things we look back upon, Babylon wondered at its origins, as much placed there then as we are placed here now, as lost and rootless in time, as decentered by the certainty of the dust we become. The flood before the reclamation of humanity, the voice of the old man who remembers it all, and the mountain we have not yet climbed. It was never, it was always, it was always never that we struggled to name ourselves in the torrential rumble of things around us. The world was not always silent. There were rivers louder than anything, and the forests creaking with our fears, the sound of the sky echoing at night, gliding our minds to the stars. If the water takes her, she's innocent. This is European fatalism. Too bad, too late. To Hammurabi, the spirit of water preserved the innocent, drowning the adulteress. It is no surprise that miraculous conceptions are uncountable in stories from the time. What priest of the court proclaimed the miracle of the queen's pregnancy, her son a king, the embodiment of the impregnating god? Horus, Krishna, Zarathustra, Noah, Pythagoras, Plato, Alexander, Mithras, Buddha, John, Jesus, born out of mysterious unions, more mysterious than the mystery of coitus. We were told of Jesus' virginal birth before we were told about sex. All we needed to know was an unnamed sin brought us into being, and Jesus was free of that sin. So was Dolly, the clone you. <laughs> Keats found a beauty I do not find. My stolen vase collects dirty socks. Sorry. Onto that vase, its mouth like the rim of a bubble that popped and froze, drying in the treeless desert, into a ring that lets the broad belly commune with the broader air, too cracked to hold anything but leaves and bones, too uneven the cracks to measure the flow of sand, still a watering jug it might make for dry distant gardens. But that vase, its battle scenery, a melange of swords and horses bright daggers from the brow of an extinct god mowing through the unidentified enemy as if it had been made of air, of pure story, just the breath of fearful seers and the unutterable markings, as if a water bird drunk on fermented swamp root had rolled, rolled it like a log while the clay was still wet. Silent. The laws needn't speak anymore. The edge and line of each character tattooed on our character assumes as good manners, justice, housed in courts wherever there is history. The sun, 
now aware of its radius, is no longer fixed on Earth, no longer watching the shadows we make. The sun is not interested in our shadows. Thank you so much for, uh, for listening and uh, for being here. Um, I'll, I'll leave you with thank you for being here. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd just be sitting here staring at my wall. That could be interesting. Um, the, I'll leave you with the title poem from Ghost Music. Uh, Ghost Music. You feel haunted when I'm around. There is little to say, and I say it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Sometimes the short poems are the best poems. <laughs> we'll take a short break. If you'd like to purchase a book from uh, Mark, I'm sure that you'd be willing to sign it. There are refreshments over here. And again, thanks to Dr. Tom Robinson and the uh, uh, River History Museum for supplying those. So we'll reconvene at just uh, about 8 o'clock. <laughs>